Chiro here for Ember Games with a review of Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Wildlands. Now, I'll give the early disclaimer here, I haven't ever played a Ghost Recon game from start to finish before, so I don't have much of a point of reference to speak to the evolution of the series. I was particularly attracted to this one due to the four-player online co-op and a massive world. Wildlands has four covert operatives sent to Bolivia to destabilize and ultimately destroy a massive cartel named Santa Blanca that has its claws thoroughly embedded in the country. Your series of main missions each apply to taking down a local Buchon, which leads you to their boss, and once enough bosses are taken down, you can go after the next tier leadership before finally getting information on the top dog, El Sueño. Each target is fairly well characterized, has specific jobs they do for the cartel, and a bit of a backstory told through videos transmitted by your handler, Karen Bowman, and documents and such that could be obtained throughout the villas. The Wildlands map is divided into several regions, with many of the Buchons running their own district. You can attempt the missions in any order you like, although they do have a ranking of how difficult they are. Enemies don't have a hit point counter, and instead, most of the time a headshot with any weapon will cause a noticeable spray of blood and fairly realistically bring almost anyone down. You and your agents also have similar realistic weaknesses, providing an experience a bit closer to reality, as in you can't just bust into a place and start running and gunning. Wildlands uses the modern shooter method of life loss. You'll see blood on the screen marking where you're getting shot from, and as you take more hits, the screen will start to lose color. Then you can get into cover and give yourself a chance to regenerate. To aid you in combat situations, you have a drone easily deployed by the push of the D-pad that switches you to a first-person view. It can be flown around for reconnaissance, marking targets, and eventually you can equip the drone with explosive or noise distractions as well. Enemies show up as blurry circles on your minimap, showing a general vicinity until they're seen, which puts a more specific dot on their location. Stealth is key in many situations, and to aid you in that, a silencer can be put on nearly any firearm. You can also perform melee kills if you get close enough to an enemy. If you're playing a single player, you can use a feature called Sync Shot, which allows you to put numbers on specific targets and give the command for you and all of your squad mates to make a shot at the same time. That can be a little more difficult with multiple human players. You gain experience in the game by completing mission and making kills, leveling your character up to a maximum of 30. Each level provides skill points that can be used in combination with resources to open new abilities like the drone explosions I mentioned, and strengthen your character's physical prowess, like how much damage they can take before dying, and the length of time you can sprint before getting tired. You gain resources through tagging supplies found on the battlefield, or completing rebel missions, which I'll get to in a minute. Since most enemies go down fairly quickly, as I mentioned, you won't see much of a power gain by leveling up, and most of your firearm attack power comes from the game's various weapons. New weapons can be obtained by locating weapon crates. There's a bit of an overkill in weapon selection, not much diversity between the dozens of choices of each style. You really could probably finish the game with your starting weapons without too much difficulty increase too. You can find the location of weapon stashes in a region by going to a white intel point on your map, which usually involves downloading something from a computer in that position or interrogating someone. You can also use these points to reveal extra skill point pickups, medals which once obtained put an additional bonus on each of the game's skill tree nodes, and to locate two different rebel mission type locations. These rebels are also working against Santa Blanca and the Policia, and are named Qataris 26. In between main missions, you can do their side missions in two different categories, from hijacking convoys, protecting radio transmitters, and knocking out enemy networks. The supply missions grant you some of the game's five resources, which are used in combination with skill points gained while leveling up to buy new abilities from the skill trees. The other type of mission builds up your rebel call-in abilities that work on a global cooldown, either requesting mortar strikes, vehicle drops, or rebels to come fight with you at a certain location. As you do more of these, you're able to increase the severity of the attack, call in more troops on the call, or get a wider supply of vehicle drops, including helicopters. Like I said, there is a global cooldown on the rebel activities, but you can commandeer vehicles, either park somewhere or by stopping drivers on the road and kicking them out if you need a ride. One frustrating thing about the vehicle drop is where it actually lands. Sometimes we'd miss completely seeing where it came down, or we'd see it on the borders of the minimap, but it wouldn't even be within that radius. Choppers would also get dropped next to trees, and you couldn't even take off with them as they'd get destroyed. There are two different wanted meters that increase based on your destruction of factions. Both the Santa Blanca Cartel, marked in orange, and the Corrupt Policia, marked in purple. If you get too high during a mission, it can greatly jeopardize your success rate. The only way to really lose ticks on the meter is to run away as quickly as you can. Sometimes you can drive specific vehicles into the two factions compounds without being recognized immediately if you had no wanted level, but dawdle around too long and they'll send the world after you. Now this digital version of Bolivia is a beautiful country. There are quite a few diverse environments that all fold believably in their transition, from forests to mountains to salt flats. This may be one of the biggest open worlds I've seen in fact, with the only issue being the repetitive nature of the content you find within. I played with Weedle and Nightwander for most of my time with this game, and we started out going for every document and weapon and every other collectible in the game while trying to max out all our skills and doing a ton of resource missions. 
We ended up skipping all the story videos fairly early on and finally just started hitting main missions only before we were done. The environments would change and there are a few different objectives like capturing a boss without being detected or tailing someone and a lot of just plain all out killing but it gets extremely repetitive about halfway in. Navigating the country on foot can be painful at times too as climbing is contextual when you can only press the button to pull yourself onto something when it's something the designers intended. This limits some mobility at times and in a game that's all about letting you create a path to your targets becomes a little burdensome. We had bouts of server issues from time to time, not able to join each other's games, etc. And that's even with that connection being open with some rigorous router tuning. We have a strange problem a couple times where somehow even though we were all in the game all the time doing the same objective, we could get out of sync with missions. Where a yellow map point showing a valid story mission for one person would turn gray for others, saying they could help the team but they weren't eligible for progression. And speaking of multiplayer, something that's kind of odd is in single player you have three AI operatives supporting you. But if you have more than one human person, that's all that's in your squad, is the player controlled characters. Which maybe the AI guys don't really contribute that much so you're not missing anything? I don't know, not sure. When a player goes down, they can wait until a teammate revives them, and your AI companions will also do reviving, although when you're playing solo there are limitations on the number of times they do that. You actually have 45 to, I don't know, it seemed like sometimes it was 60 seconds, where your character will lie there squirming before you're able to respawn yourself. But after the timer is up, you can choose not to respawn and continue to wait for someone to come and revive you. That minute does feel like forever, but it does make you play a bit more careful when the only penalty for death is waiting for a long time before you can come back in, as even on respawn it will sometimes start you a long way from the target you were working on. Overall though, if you're looking for a strategic shooter to play online with some friends, Ghost Recon has a huge, diverse, beautiful open world, an overkill on weapon options that unfortunately don't feel much different between guns of the same type, tons of collectibles, a sizable set of main missions and side missions that begin to feel repetitive but allow you to do them in any order you wish, a story that requires you to read documents or stop to watch videos to follow it and ended up feeling a bit generic, no one set path to approach enemy targets, a decent sized skill tree that requires a decent amount of resource grinding to open it all up. Rated as an open world third person shooter, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Wildlands receives a 58 out of 100 on my true 1 to 100 scale with 50 being an average game. This is Jiro from Ember Games, thanks for watching. Please feel free to subscribe for more objective reviews or find me on Twitter at Ember Games for new video notifications.